Hi there, I'm Carol and I am the Crafty Grandma. Today we are going to complete my third project that I have done live. Um, my first one was only on Facebook. There were some technical problems there, so we got that was all cleared up. And then the second one seemed to go fairly smoothly, but we had some lighting issues, so we took care of those. This time around, we seem to have solved most of our technical problems. We've got the lighting pretty good, everything seems to be fine, and this time I had a quilting problem. So in my last part of this uh, video, uh, video series, I had a little bit of a hiccup. It turned out that I had cut my blocks a quarter of an inch too small, and therefore, instead of having four disappearing nine patch blocks, I ended up with two disappearing nine patch blocks. So just to go along with things as we do in the real world, we have to always work around what happens. Instead of making a quilt, I went ahead and I have made a table runner. What I did though was a little bit different with this was I added some uh, Arselbright, hold on, what is the name of it? Inselbright. Yes, Inselbright. Inselbright. And what that does is it does not allow you to put things in the microwave. So we don't use this stuff to make our potato bags or anything like that. Anything you're going to put in the microwave, that's, this is not going to work for. But it does make this a hot pad. So now when you have this sitting on your dining room table, instead of having to bring out hot pads to keep uh, hot dishes from damaging your dining room table, all you have to do is set them on your table runner and you will have and uh, it'll be insulated and it'll be a great hot pad. Um, in addition to that, we did put the, some batting in just to give it a little bit more heft so we, we make sure that it's not just the Inselbright. And we have our backing on, so we've got our, our sandwich here. Instead of being a three-layer sandwich, this time we have a four-layer sandwich. Then the other thing we've done is we've completed our binding, and I am going to use a multicolored binding. And if you did, again, watch the last part of this video series, you saw that I had some problems with my binding, getting that straightened around. So I, I made it too short at first. Hopefully we've got just enough to be able to, to piece around. Um, and it, I've measured everything a couple times, and it looks like we have about a half an inch more than we need. So we should be okay there. Um, I apologize if you give me just one moment. I need to turn something off. I'm hearing something beeping. Oh, sorry about that. Thank you so much for giving me that chance. I forgot to turn the volume off on my regular phone and it was trying to tell me that I had a message. So no more disturbances, we got this done. So we've got our binding, we've got our, our sandwich, and I have three different colors of cotton thread. Red, white, and blue. Um, trying to decide exactly which route I want to take on this. I'm thinking I'm going to just go with the uh, blue because the white that I have is a bright white, which makes perfect sense if you're using standard whites. But I'm, I look at this, and this is not a bright white fabric. This is kind of a, uh, a dull white fabric. So the bright white would be the color of the Inselbright here. And you can see the difference in the coloring of the fabric is just a bit. There's, there's just enough that it's, it's, this would just stand out like a sore thumb. So I'm going to set this one aside. And then the red, I do like the red. I'm just afraid that the red, if I put it as the quilting thread throughout this, that it's going to stand out so much that you can't see anything but the red quilting thread. And there's so many nice designs in here that I want to do it that, that I really want to see that. So I think I'm going to go with the blue. And I know blue is a little bit dark, but it should fade in pretty nicely. And what I'm going to do, I'm not going to get terribly complicated. Any of you that wa have watched my other couple shows know that I am not a free motion quilter kind of gal. So I'm going to be taking things and doing stitch in the ditch to begin with. And I think I'm going to stitch around the blocks 
this way and around the blocks this way. Um, Inselbright, I never look to see if they have a rule on how far they can be stitched. Let's look. They do not say anything about the fact that you have to have so many inches between. Um, no, they do not. All right. So my batting that I'm using is from the Warm Company, Warm and Natural. And their rule is you, ca you ca have to have at least or no more than 10 inches between your quilting stitches. And I'm, so I'm going to measure from here to here and see how far across that is. Where's my, I've got a million tape measures around and never want to know when I need it. Okay. So this would be a big distance, and that is just about, uh, just over eight and a half inches between quiltings. And then I'm going to go, and I'm, because this would be the widest part to the edge, and that would be 12 inches. So we can't do that, and 10 inches would be there. So I might switch colors and stitch the red, or I could use a white on the red, a red on the white, and a white on the blue. I'm not certain how I'm going to do the edges right now, but at least I know that between, on the main part of the quilt, if I don't do any quilting other than stitch in the ditch around these four pieces, we should still be fine. Now that's, uh, that's getting a little long. Might have to go this way also. That might make even more sense and get that all taken care of. That way we get enough stitching in. But we are going to do the stitch in the ditch. That's how I'm going to do it. I happen to have a foot that works perfectly, that is designed specifically for stitch in the ditch. Because of the fact that I'm not a free motion kind of gal and I do so much stitch in the ditch, it is something that I use frequently. If you don't do something like that all the time, you don't need to get a special foot for it. You can just go ahead and use your standard presser foot. Uh, just so you know, these are the scraps I still have left. Oh, those are scraps, and I still have some more strips, um, and I have some other strips that are red, white, and blue. So I have, at this point, out of one jelly roll that I purchased that had a bunch of different red, white, and blue fabric, different shades of red, white, and blue, I have now completed two projects using that jelly roll, and I have enough that I could probably do at least one more full quilt not certain which way I'm going to go, whether I'm going to do that or not, but it is something to consider. These jelly rolls can go quite a ways. Um, my next project that I've got coming up, I just put out on, or just put online, is going to be a log cabin quilt. I'm going to use the red and then the black and the white with the black um, strips that are here. Um, I'm not going to use the white with the red and the red with the white it's going to be like six blocks so it's it's not very much most of it's going to be the black with the white and the white with the black and then just to do something different i'm going to try doing the, my border using this charm pack and so that's going to be something different for me there are grays in here and i'm thinking i may not use the grays i'm just going to use some of the blacks that are on the bottom and some of the whites that are up on the top but that's going to depend on how much I need to get done. Because at this point, I'm debating back and forth. I've sketched it up two ways, one with a 12-inch block and one with a 14-inch block, because I'm just going to do a small lap quilt. So you never know what that's going to be like. That's going to be our next project. And again, that's only going to use a very small amount of that jelly roll. Um, so that jelly roll is still going to be able to give me probably, well, definitely at least one more project, potentially even two. So the, je the jelly rolls are definitely a very good investment as far as if you want to get multiple small projects out of them, you're going to get a ton of them. Um, something else I was looking at today was a Bellagio quilt. So that may be something coming up in the future too, because that's Basically, it, it's a bunch of strips, and you cut them, and you put them in interesting styles, and it makes a really, really unique-looking quilt. So let's get going with our show today. We are going to set up our sewing machine for uh, quilting with our uh, walking foot, 
and change out to our uh, quilting needle. Since we've already completed our binding, we're not going to have to be switching back and forth between the quilting needle and the regular needle. So we're just going to switch over to the quilting needle and get our uh, walking foot on and go to town. So here we go. All right. So I'm going to get the quilt off the design wall and bring it over here. And then we are going to set this machine up for quilting. There's that. Here's that. I do still have on my straight stitch plate. I have not changed that out. Usually when I'm quilting, I tend to leave it on. Um, I'm going to get rid of the 60 weight thread that I use for piecing. We don't need that. Okay, why well, do not we don't want to get caught in the there we go. I don't need all that stuff flying around. All right, let's put quarter inch piecing foot down, get rid of our bobbin, okay, needle goes away, and in the garbage it goes. That out of my back. Someone somewhere along the lines told me that thread can go bad if you if it if it's exposed to the air. So I have st I started a very very long time ago putting my thread into baggies. Because of that, they don't store very well, and I haven't figured out a better way to do that yet. But as of right now, I just have a box full of baggies. Now, it does make it convenient because I can keep my bobbins and my thread together. <coughs> Excuse me. But it can be challenging to find a specific color or thread that you need. Okay. So I mentioned that my machine has... I have a specific foot for stitching in the ditch, and that's what this is. It is the same. The walking foot has interchangeable feet. So this is my walking foot. This is the standard quilting foot. It goes right down the center. You can't do any designs or anything like that. It is just a straight stitch foot. This one has the added advantage of having a guide in the front. So if you stick this in the seam area and it goes along, you should, and I say you should because it doesn't always work for me, you should be stitching directly into the seam and you should not see the quilting. The quilting um, should be done on the back, but it, you should not see it in the front. It should be in between the seams. That being said, it doesn't always work out that way. And sometimes you go a little off. So you want to just pay attention. That's why, even though I hope I'm not even going to see this blue, I still wanted to take into consideration the fact that it does, it could potentially show. Um, the other thing you could do is you can use an invisible thread. Now, invisible thread is a plastic thread, so it can be... Um, stretchy and it can be hard to use and you tr tr most people avoid using it in their bobbin I have used it in both my as my upper thread and my lower thread but it was very challenging and there was a lot of stop and starts so a lot of people will use the invisible thread on the top but put a standard thread in their bobbin area 
All right, let's see if we can get this on here. Don't know. All right. Bobbin is threaded. We need a quilting needle. I am using an Inspira 80. You can use whatever brand you want. I prefer the Inspira brand, but you're, and I'll tell you right now, if you buy a new machine, whoever, whatever company, the machine shop is in, works with says, you can, you absolutely have to use this brand needle in our machine, which is the way this particular machine is. They do claim that you absolutely have to use an Inspira. Which is not true because I use a Schmetz every so often. It just depends on where I've gotten them and how much they cost. Because I buy them based on how many I use. Mm. Sorry, needed some water there. <coughs> Excuse me. Ugh. So I tend to get whatever is either on, not necessarily whatever's on sale, but a, a decent quality that's on sale at a lower price. All right, so I'm going to get rid of my regular foot, and I'm going to put on my stitch in the ditch foot. Get that out of the way. Come on. There you go. All right, that's attached. And I am going to do, uh, thread my upper area. Thread my needle. Try to avoid wasting a ton of thread. Oh, that is really All right. My stitch, I am going to increase. It's set for 3.0. I'm going to go up to 4.0. Um, I really should take the time to remember what those are in... Uh, regular stitches, but I can't off the top of my head. And I am going to start stitching. If you are doing free motion or anything of that nature, you always want to start in the middle and work out so you can be sure that your fabric is as taut as possible. I am starting at the edge because I do not do the poke through and everything else, the start and stop. I do not like to start and stop in the middle of a quilt. I like to start and stop on the edge. And I've taken my time to pin it up fairly well so we shouldn't have a problem. So this is how I start. And I'm not going to do anything weird or funny or anything like that. All I'm going to do is go along and stitch. When I get to the corner here, oh, forgot, needle down. This machine does not default to needle down position. I prefer the needle down position, so I always set it, but when I first turn on the machine, it has to be reset every time you start the machine. All right, now, the edge of the fabric here, I want, it, I want to get my stitching all the way to where this blue fabric starts. To do that, there's a line on the side of my foot that comes out right where the needle position is. So I'm going to stitch until I get to that needle position. And then I'm going to turn. And if you look, you'll see there's a safety pin in my way. So I'm going to need to get the safety pin off. And as I do this now, I want to make sure I've got the bottom fabric and all the layers taut. So kind of hold them apart. Do not push or pull the fabric, but hold the fabric taut.
come into a corner. We're going to turn. Now this safety pin's out of the way, so we're not going to run into it, so we can just keep going. And keeping it taut. Missed it. I'm too short. Hold on just a second. One more stitch. There we go. Eyes weren't working very well, obviously. I have the ability to push the button and my presser foot pops up. If you don't, just lift up your handle a little bit further. All right, so we have one completed quilt run. Now we're going to do the second one. I'm having to watch on this side where my when I get to the line. I think I went too far. No, I didn't. Okay, cool. Looks like we're going to have a pin in our way. So again, pop out the pin. Do not stitch over the safety pins. That would be very bad for any machine you own. Okay, go this way.
Alright. So now you can see we have stitched around those four blocks. No, you can't. There you go. That's what I want. We've stitched around the block. We've stitched around here. We've got another block. So now we're going to move on to the other side. And we're going to do the blue just like we did now, just like we did this past time. And then we're going to look and make sure and see whether we need to do it further in also. Okay. So get myself lined up. A safety pin in our way, so safety pin goes bye bye. Threads all over the place. Okay, now we were able to get here without removing these safety pins, but if I turn the safety pin is going to get caught underneath the presser foot. So we're going to have to get rid of these safety pins. So now we'll have to focus on our keeping fabrics taunt because now we've lost that the safety pin. Ah, safety pin, we're going to be able to get by. Just squeak by, I think. Excellent. We have the other side to work on.
safety pin out of the way. Still one off. I thought I got it right there. There we go. Let's look at this on the wall and see where we stand. All right. Now, as I wanted, the quilting has gone into the quilt. You really can't see anywhere that there is quilting. So that, so I have accomplished what I want. Even though I've got a blue fabric, or a blue thread, which you would see, you would think would be really dark and stand out a lot, it's not doing that on this, because I did stitch in the ditch, and where I got off of the ditch, it kind of blends in with the fabric that I'm using. So that worked out well. But now let's look on the back. And keep in mind, our batting needs to be at least, needs to have quilting at least every 10 inches. So we're going to look at it. And we're going to go, oh, let's see. Distance there is 11 inches. So that's too far apart. There, it's eight and a half. There, it's eight and a half. There, it's 11 again. And I can't tell you where the edges of my fabric of the quilt are, but just here, I can tell you that this area here, this area here, this area here, and this area here need some additional quilting. Um, we don't have to do it everywhere. We just need to put a little bit of extra quilting in to get them those areas tighter so they don't come apart. So let's look. The areas we're talking about when we look at the front of the quilt, let's see, come on. When it gets this thick it's hard to hang on the wall. I obviously am going to need another gadget here somewhere. So we're talking down here that we're having the problems, that we don't have enough stitching. We're talking up here no, not up, not up there. Down here, down here, up here, and up here. So I think I'm going to outline the four red squares, and that should give us enough quilting 
to cover all of the areas that we need to have at least 10 inches in. So back to the machine we go. Oh, I apologize. My camera has done something odd. It has refocused itself while we were gone. Let us get that wider out there. Let's see. Can we get it to go out? Come on. See, at the beginning of this part, I made the comment that we hadn't had any technical difficulties, and now it decides it wants to be difficult. Let's get this. Let's see. Back. All right, now. Now it's having light issues. This was what happens when you go on live. Let's see, is there anything else I can do to fix this? There might be. All right, let's see if we do this. Let's see if we can move the camera to a different location and if that will help with the light problem. How are we doing? That's not quite where we want to be. All right. A little bit different angle going on, but seems to have done the trick. So let's sew around the red squares. I'm still looking okay? Yep, we're still looking okay. All right. Now, one of the things when quilting, you need to make sure another, uh, well, there's multiple things going on, but another a definite thing you need to pay attention to is the fact that the fabric sometimes wants to hang over the side of your machine and then it gets caught or it's, and so it's heavy and it pulls. You want to keep an eye on that because otherwise your stitches are going to get smaller because it's going to be trying to dry, pull something that it can't pull because there's no way to get it pulled. All right. Okay. I have to roll this quilt up. Turn, and there we go. And since I'm here, I'm going to go ahead and stitch in the ditch along the blue line, because we had said we were going to do that anyway. Can you see what? No, we won't do that right now. There we go. Do it over here instead of having all that bulky fabric in the way.
That's done. So now we will do the second block of red. Definitely with these long sides, you want to be careful because you it wanted to hang over and I could feel the fabric or the quilt not being pulled correctly. All right, are we set in the right spot? Roll the quilt again. So now we're basically right in the middle. One more stitch. There we go. This red one. Yep. Don't run over the safety pin. That was close. It's real close. I don't know how I'm going to get that out of there. Come on. This is what happens when you don't pay attention to what you're doing. Got the safety pin. There we go. Okay, locate the fourth red block. There it is. Make sure my thread's going the right direction. And One of the worst things about quilting is having to roll these things up as you go around. Let's get that in and get that rolled up. And now we will stitch. 
stitch down the side. How can I get to you? And the last piece of quilting I think we need is going to be right here on this blue piece. This one's going to be in the way this time. Wasn't quite out far enough. this one. All right. Okay. Let's go look at our quilt. So now, on the back of our quilt, you can see we have quite a few lines, and if we measure them, there's at least 10 inches by all of them. So we have quilted our, quilted our quilt <laughs> um, completely. Now we're going to get rid of the safety pins. We don't need those anymore. We've already done it. We've done our quilting. And as I've mentioned before, I continue, will continue to mention, I store my safety pins open. Um, you can always tell when I've never used a safety pin in a box because it's going to be closed it's when I, it's in the box. Um, I just see no reason to close them and open them again other than safety. So if you have small children running around that like to get into your stuff, remember that you have, if you want if you have that going on, you want to make sure that the, the safety pins are closed. That's why they're safety. Um, well, actually, that's probably not where they got their name. But anyway, they are safety pins, and they can be closed, and that's good. And that way you won't get your finger pricked. Now in the last part, um, when I was trying to figure out what to do with just two blocks instead of four, when, so, was since I couldn't make a lap quilt, um, I did go online and I checked to see how wide a standard table runner is. And this one will finish to be just about an inch shy of the widest table runner. So it is kind of a large table runner, but it's just exactly the right length, the minimum length. Um, I could have done it differently, but again, there were things going on, and I sort of wasn't, I was going, flying by the seat of my pants, which you have to do every so often when you're quilting. Um, but so if this looks a little wide, it is kind of wide for a table runner, it, but it's still within the standard dimensions, according to a couple resources on the internet. Okay. So now we need to trim it down so that everything is around the edge is straight. Need a ruler for that and a rotary cutter. Ruler, rotary cutter. And uh, since I know that my seam is straight, I am going to measure it happens to be one and a half inches, so I'm going to measure out one and a half inches and trim up all the layers and throw them in the garbage. 
Then I am going to turn the entire piece around and do the same thing on the other side. One and a quarter inches. Okay. Now, I don't have a good lineup point for this, for the sides. What I do have is I have a nice straight edge to work off of. So I'm going to, and I obviously have to do this in multiple sections because I don't have a ruler long enough to go all the way up. Can you hand cut this? Yes. If you are a nice straight hand cutter, feel free, grab your standard cutting scissors and, and cut along. I end up with wavy lines, so I like to use the rotary cutter. So I need to line up the bottom and the seam, and that gets me a nice straight edge. And cut to where my mat ends. Now I've got two stitched seams here. So I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to line it up. Now in this case, that square is actually two inches square and two and a quarter. So it's two inches where the stitching is, and it's two and a quarter this way because it's got the quarter of an inch on this side for um, piece, putting on the binding. So that's going to get us really close to the edge there. Not quite all the way. And we're going to use our straight lines again. Our edge of the fabric. And our one and a quarter in. Oops. Move it over. There we go. Line it all up. And trim. Flip it all around. There we go. Line it up so we have straight edges. And you always want to be very careful when you're measure when you're setting up your ruler, especially these long ones, because as you go along, it can start to, just a little hair off can start messing you up everywhere. water well I'm here. Okay. Binding. Second to the last step of any project. Binding.
So we don't want to start on the edge. You don't want to start on the edge. You want to start somewhere in the middle. And on this particular design uh, setup, I should say, not design, um, on a table runner, you want to start on one of the long sides. You don't want to start on one of the little sides. Go ahead and start on one of the long sides. That gives you plenty of room to work as you're doing things. Um, Then the other thing you don't want to do is start on the very end of your binding. Excuse me, I'm going to start somewhere around here. And that gives me an area that I can use to join to the other piece when I get over there, when I get around. So here we go. And let's keep our fingers crossed that we have enough binding again, because it's going to be close. Um, I don't need the stitch in the ditch foot, so I'm going to pop that off. And I'm going to put on my standard straight stitch for the, for the walking foot. Okay. So with binding, I do use the seal in the seam, seal in the stitch option. Um, if you don't have a newer machine, if you have an older machine, what you're going to do is you're going to go forward three stitches, backwards three stitches, and then forward three stitches again. I happen to have a new machine, so it has what's called the fix feature, and it takes care of that for me. So, also, I need to figure out where a quarter of an inch is. I happen to know that a quarter of an inch is just inside this toe. So, my fabric is going to sit just inside there. That means this feed dog and this feed dog really aren't doing anything because they're sitting outside the quarter of an inch. So, the other two feed dogs are the ones that I'm relying on to do all the work. Keep your binding straight along the edge of the quilt as you cut it. That's why we were so careful when we cut the quilt to make sure it was straight. Do I need to be using the blue thread? No. Just dawned on me that I had left the blue thread in. I'm not going to worry about it. Um, this, color, this particular thread will not be seen. It's going to be inside the binding so it's no big deal and I will be using the blue on the outside when I do the stitch in the ditch around the edges here um, you'll see what I mean in a few minutes but so I didn't even think about it and I didn't bother to change out the thread color because it really doesn't matter Okay, so we're coming up on the corner here. Corners are always fun. We are going to stitch until we get a quarter inch away from the edge. And again, I happen to have this snazzy little foot that tells me quarter of an inch from the needle is right on the edge of the foot here. It's not out to where the toes start, but it's back here. Now I'm where I need to be. Now I'm going to turn the quilt and I am going to stitch off the side. Now 
I'm going to turn the quilt again so it's facing the direction I want to go. Binding going everywhere. Keeping the unfinished side of the, the batting, or binding. Get lined up so that you have a straight seam or straight fold at the very top and you have the binding matched up on the side. Move the, fat, the quilt up to where the needle is. And slowly get her started again. So what's happening is the fabric is getting caught on the foot, just on the edge of the foot. So that's what my issue is here. When I started quilting and started doing bindings, first of all, bindings were the most challenging thing I had ever seen in my life. I was so dumbstruck by them for the longest time. It wasn't even funny. Um, but I pinned it all the way around before I got started. They didn't have the little plastic clips yet when I started quilting. They, so we were using pins and we would pin and I pinned the binding all the way around. And I've mentioned before, I was a pinaholic. I used pins everywhere. If there was something to be done, I, I pinned it down at I put like three pins every inch. At this point, I've gotten to the point where I realized that that was just extreme, but it was how I learned and how I got to feel where everything needed to be and how everything needed to be. So if you're just starting out and you feel like you need to pin everything, go for it. There are no quilting police unless you submit your quilt for a prize in a competition, there are no quilting police. So do what you need to do to keep quilting. Okay. Now we're going to go this way. So again, we fold under. If you don't have one of these doohickeys, don't worry about it. You, Find yourself, order some Chinese and or Asian food of any kind, and um, use a chopstick. Why do you insist on being too far up on one side and not far enough up on the other? You're not folded right underneath, obviously. This piece right here just wants to sit too high for me, and I don't know what its problem is. Because that's just going to give me extra bulk. I can't see. All right, there we go. did get nope that's just threat I poked myself earlier with with my with my doohickey and I when I saw that red I thought I had actually drawn blood but no just a piece of thread
binding wants to get all twisted up here. Let's get it straight. There it goes, slipping off of the foot again. Now, is it hurting anything for that to sit up there? No, it's just annoying. Okay, there's the edge. on my pegboard back there that I keep getting caught on. I might have to get rid of that particular hook, I think. Not want to move straight. Okay, last corner. Oh, this is going to be fun. I've got a seam and a corner. All right, 
let's see here. A lot of layers. Let's get this lined up. Give those feed dogs a workout. And we're not going to go all the way to the end, just like before. So let's get it there, and I think that's a good width length. that out of there. There that bulk. Oops. Now the fun part. So in order to finish the binding and have it completely flat and nice and all that good stuff, you need two and a half inches of overlap. The reason I need two and a half inches of overlap is because my binding is two and a half inches wide. If my binding was two and a quarter inches wide, I would need two and a quarter inches of an overlap. So whatever width of binding you're using, that is the width you need of overlap. So let's measure and it looks like my second time measuring was right on because it looks like I have just over three inches so I need to trim off a half an inch of either color. I am going to trim off a half an inch of the blue. there to there, half an inch. Get the ruler out of the way. Trim the fabric. Throw the fabric underneath there for use as starter fabric in my next project. I'm going to trim up here so we don't have that all messed up. And now we have to join the binding pieces just like we joined them all the way around before. So this means that we take one piece of fabric with the right side up and the second piece of binding also with the right side up. and match them up so that you can we can put a stitch in and join them. And this is to me always challenging. I have always had bad luck with it or not bad luck. I, it gets done. It's just challenging because the fabric wants to to wrinkle up instead of lay straight because it's still attached to the binding and so on and so forth, or attached to the quilt and so on and so forth. So do I need my big walking foot for this? No. Am I going to use it anyway? Yes. Get it going and keep the fabric straight. That is the biggest part of this particular activity. Keeping the fabric straight. Could I have drawn a straight line across with my ruler? Yes, most definitely. Feel free to do that if you want. I don't care that much. Well, I shouldn't say that. Also, should I have, now that I'm looking at it, probably dropped down my stitch length? Probably. 
That I probably should have done. And that I did not do. All right, so now we lay down our binding and it's the right length to complete. Okay, thread in the back. Come on, there we go. Starting a little further up than you stopped. Start again. Make sure you keep your quilt up so that it can feed dogs can do their job. Mine was starting to pull a little bit, so I realized that it was getting caught on the table. Stitch a little bit past where you started before, and stop. Okay, let's get our clips on. So just as before, um, you don't want to start at a corner. I need my clippers. They're there. Um, you want to start somewhere in the middle, and that way you can get all the everything laid out, folded over correctly. Um, and then typically, I when I get to a corner, I actually will clip around the corner first, and then. Go back a cup, back and forth a couple of times. Let me get my safety pins off of this first. Sorry, I had I forgot to bring my safety pin box over there when we were sewing. So some of the safety pins I had to take off while sewing, while quilting, didn't end up in the box. And if I don't put them there now, I will forget about them later, and things will I will go looking for them, and things will not be fun. All right, so fold it over. On these clips, they have an, a, a flat side and a rounded side. Make sure the rounded side is up, and they are made perfe perfectly to go on the edge of a quilt. Okay. Now, I have an extra layer in here, so I am going to be clipping a little bit more frequently than I did last time because I want to make sure that it goes all the way around and it's, it's holding tight, so when I'm quilting, when I'm stitching in the ditch later on, around here, I get it all around tight. I am not going to hand stitch this, FYI. Um, many, there are schools of thought that say that if you attach your binding to the front of the quilt, like I just, just did, that then you need to hand whip stitch the binding to the back. I avoid hand sewing like the plague. I do not enjoy it. It is not an activity that I have ever been fond of. So therefore, I will not be hand stitching this to the back. I will be using my machine. What that means is I need to make absolutely certain that my binding goes all the way around and covers up the stitching that I did to attach the binding to the top of the quilt. Otherwise, it's going to show in the end, and it's just not going to be pretty. Okay, so I, I've done either side of the corner now. Now I'm going to do the actual corner. I will be stitching this way, so I want the fold of the miter in the corner to go the way I'm going to be stitching. So I, I've got it going down. 
That way I don't have to worry about it getting caught up in, on the presser foot or on the feed dogs or anything like that. It's going to be right there. And it's going to keep going with the flow of the fat, with the flow of my stitching. I mentioned on another video, I think it was the last project I worked on, um, I had seen something where they added a quarter of an inch of the batting to the, off the edge. Instead of cutting the batting even with the edge of the quilt, they add, left a quarter of an inch so that the binding would have more um, heft to it. Especially with this one, I don't, need, I don't even need to think about doing that because we added a third layer anyway with the Inselbright. So that gives me some extra heft to it. I don't know. I've never noticed that my binding didn't have heft to it, but maybe, maybe one of the next quilts I'll think about trying it just to see if it makes a difference to me or not. At this point, I honestly don't know. I, I haven't paid enough attention, I guess, to whether my binding has heft to it or not. This corner I've got a seam and so this is being a little challenging. It's got a lot of heft to it. I'm going to trim off the tip of this corner just ever so slightly. It seems to want to bunch up a little bit there. So let's see if that makes a difference. And it did. It was just ever so slightly. Like I said, there's a seam because of the way I did the binding and the corner at the same time. So that was a lot of fabric in one little spot. Like I said, I am putting a lot of clips in here and making sure that the binding is on fairly tight so that we don't have any slippage because of that extra layer. I want to make sure we get it covering up that seam so we don't have any problems when we, when we do the stitching.
missed a little seam thingy there. Usually those go out of the way because of the, I usually start far or end far enough out that they don't get, they don't show up on the edge of the quilt. Apparently I stopped short on that one. Okay, last corner. Get it all set. All right, that one's upside down. That's a clear one. That's hard to tell, Up right side and ups down side. Okay, we are now nicely clipped. We're going to go back over to the machine. Oh, this is going to be tricky with this camera in this end, where it's at. Let's see. Slide that under there. And we should be good to go. All right. Let's see now. We need to switch to our stitch in the ditch foot. So that I can go straight. Come on. I'm going to fix and uh, seam, steal the both start and finish of the seam. I am going to get as close as I possibly can to my clips. That way I keep all that fabric tucked under tight until I get almost right on top of it. off a little bit. Man, it's gonna stay in the ditch. under.
Okay. Corners are fun. Remember, we folded it so that the miter is going the direction we need it to. But now we need to get it around. We need to get to a quarter of an inch of the edge because that's where the binding should be and stay in the ditch. All right, we make it. Come on cords over there and things that are hanging around. Everything's getting caught. All right. And it looks like we made it. Excellent. string off now before I forget. I'll get over there and I'll sit, continue stitching on over the head of it and it'll get all tangled up in this foot. Just won't look pretty.
We are almost finished with the binding. Woohoo! Working our way around. I think I ended up going one stitch too far. I did. Alright, so I'm going to go back one. shouldn't have gone that stitch. I was sitting there looking at it, thinking I needed to, but I didn't. Let's look at it. We, oh wow, I think I got it way too tight. We definitely have everything stitched in. In fact, a lot of it is really overstitched. So I could have gone with a two and a quarter inch binding or not, a, it shouldn't have pushed it so far, but I did. Okay, let's see here. Let's go over this way. Okay, last thing we always need on every quilt is a label. So, make it yourself, have someone else make it. Uh, this is from a company called Label Weavers, um, and it's not what I'm going to stick with. It's what I happen to have at this point in time, but it's not what's going to be my finished product. All right, this is the one point where I absolutely have to hand stitch and I have no choice in the matter. So I need a little bit of thread. I'm gonna get use the blue thread that I was using because why not? My needle. My needle threader. work now I've never tried it before but I figured I thought I thought I would try it just to see if it would work it didn't I was getting ready to say this could take a few hours but hey finally went through whoa bobbin has escaped Set you back by the machine.
Okay. You can put the, the, the label wherever your little heart desires. I'm just going to put it right here. Do not go all the way through the quilt. Just try and go through the the bottom or the backing and, you know, maybe the batting if you're so inclined. But definitely just try and keep it. Do not go through the front because if you go through the front, it's going to show up on your quilt all the time. And it'll just, that's just not right. If we were going to do that, we could have just used a machine to do it. Simple whip stitch. And again, I am no good at hand stitching. I hate it. It is not something I like to do. Some other people can do it much better than I can. That being said, I love to cross stitch. I don't do it much anymore, but I do love to cross stitch. Now, some people say that having pre-printed labels is not acceptable because you're not putting your, the date on it. And that is a very good point. If you are doing something that's going to be an heirloom quilt, um, something that you're planning on fa your family keeping for a really long time, pa passing it down, so on and so forth like that, you want to put a date on it. So you might either have a special label made just for that quilt or if you have the ability to do embroidery, do that. The other thing you can do is most of the newer sewing machines have letters and numbers on them. So you can just use your sewing machine and stitch in the appropriate date. These are all ideas on how to get around the problem of putting a date on your quilt. Come on. Okay, and another project completed. So we have a patriotic disappearing nine patch table runner hot pad. Lots and lots of uses for this. So looks more complicated than it obviously was because all we had to do was sew two nine patches together, cut them in half, cut them in quarters, and then go from there. Being said, it was obviously more difficult because I screwed up and forgot to pay attention to how far I was cutting. But Patriotic Nine Patch in the books. Uh, next week, we were 
potentially I won't do anything tomorrow. I haven't decided. Um, today is Thursday, so um, I'm not. I haven't decided if I'm going to do anything tomorrow. Um, I am really looking forward to doing a double disappearing nine patch where you use the char a charm pack of five inch blocks and a charm pack of seven inch blocks, which I happen to have eight inch blocks, but we're going to see if it works. Um, it was something I had never seen before, and as I was doing some research for this quilt, I happened to come across the double disappearing, so that's something. But definitely next Monday, we are going to start the quilt with the strips and uh, do a log cabin and just a basic lap throw and uh, put a border around it, things like that. Um, but we'll start that on Monday, and it's been a pleasure doing this one with you. If you liked the video, please click the like button, and if you want to know when I'm going to be live again, go ahead and hit the subscribe button. I've also made up some playlists of the different things that I've completed so far, so as you go through, you can pick an actual, uh, whichever project you want and start with part one and work through however many parts there are, depending on how long that particular uh, craft activity was. So. Have a great day. Thank you.